What a wonderful time of year this is when we're given the opportunity to celebrate the most glorious event in, in the history of the world, that resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love the opening lines of that beloved hymn, I know that my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives. He lives who once was dead. He lives my ever-living head. I want, to, I want to approach this subject today from a slightly different angle. I want to change one word for a moment and let's explore what happens. I want to change the word from lives to lived. I know that my Redeemer lived. Now, what do I mean by that? Rather than putting all of the focus on the event of the resurrection that happened on Easter morn, I want to go back to his ministry and some of the things that happened in his life that show that Jesus chose to live for us in order to build his character and his capacity to be able to perform that infinite atonement and to, to be able to endure infinite agony and suffering in our behalf. So, to begin with, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus endures three intense temptations from the devil. Now, stop and think about that for a moment. He did not allow himself to indulge in any kind of sin. He didn't allow himself the, the capacity to give in. He lived for us through those temptations and he withstood them, thus making it so that he would be able to still qualify as our Savior and as our Redeemer down the road. Next, everything that Jesus taught everything he shared with the people, either through parable or, or through direct teaching, shows us that he is living for us by, by showing us how we can live. In fact, at his Last Supper, there's a fascinating little interchange that takes place there. This is in John chapter 14, verse 5, where Thomas one of his apostles says, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In essence, he's telling his apostles, and by extension, he's telling us, there is no secret passageway somewhere else. He's saying, I am the way. I know that my Redeemer lived is an invitation for us to explore his life and to see the way he lived his life so that we can better emulate it, so that we can follow him and become more like him in the process as Thomas and those other apostles learned on that uh, beautiful night 2,000 years ago. Then we have the miracles that Jesus performed. He healed, he fed, he sustained, he calmed, he gave life to the dead and sight to the blind and a new, new lease on life for those who had leprosy or who were lame or halt or withered in any manner. I love that Jesus didn't just do these things in isolation, he did them so that we could see his power not only in their life 2,000 years ago, but that we could see his hand reflected in the miracles that he brings into our life today and, by extension, the invitation that we walk with him and do the things that he has done 
so that we likewise can look around at those miracles, both big and small, that need to be performed for people who are struggling all around us, whether it be lifting up the hands that hang down or feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, or giving uh, powerful uh, reassurance to people through blessings or prayer or through our very presence to mourn with those that mourn or comfort those that stand in need of comfort or to help those who are struggling in any way. He lived and he showed us then how to live. Then we bring the story to Gethsemane's doorstep where he is ready to begin that infinite atoning sacrifice. Once again, back in John chapter 14, we are mere mom moments away from Jesus beginning that, that infinite agony in Gethsemane and culminating the next morning on the cross. And what does he say to his apostles? Chapter 14, verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I find that interesting that here's Jesus Christ on the threshold of Gethsemane. He is about to enter into that infinite agony of the atonement. And what is he doing? He's turned outward, worried about his apostles and how they might feel a little anxious and troubled, and he's reassuring them and giving peace to them. I know that my Redeemer lived. He lived. He didn't just survive, but he, he wasn't just going through the motions here. He was turned outward even at that late hour when, when this uh, suffering was imminent. He was still turned outward, worried about his apostles, and there's no record in the account of them coming to him, trying to reassure him on this threshold of Gethsemane, but I love the fact that Jesus is so focused on what the needs around him may be and meeting those needs. He's showing us once again how to live today. So as we pick up this story in Matthew chapter 26, verse 36, we're told that he came with them unto a place called Gethsemane, which means oil press. It's a place where they would process olives and squeeze them and press them so they could get the olive oil out. It's such a beautiful symbolic name for what Jesus was about to do going into this into this particular garden. Verse 37 or 30 verse 37 tells us and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be very sorrowful and very heavy. And he turns to them and he says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. This seems to be a profound way for him to say to them, oh no, I think I'm going to have a hard time even surviving this. Will you, will you watch with me? And then he leaves them there and verse 39 tells us he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying, oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. This to me is such a critical moment in this, in this story of Jesus' infinite atonement where it hits him with that full force up front and he falls to the ground on his face and he's pleading with God to take this away. I can imagine that every element of his physical nature, everything that he has inherited from his mortal mother, Mary, 
all of those those natural tendencies and and earthly feelings and emotions that you and I feel at that moment would have likely been pleading with him to give up and to stop and to not endure this infinite agony, this pain that is beyond description. I am so grateful that Jesus lived for me and for you rather than giving up early or allowing his spirit to leave his body before the full price was paid for each of us. Now, what is it? What is it that's in that millstone symbolically weighing down on the Lord Jesus Christ that would be so heavy that would cause him to fall to the ground on his face? We know from scriptures that he is suffering for our sins, and sins have some consequences attached to them. As we do things that are inappropriate, as we sin and we break God's laws, we experience some emotions, things like guilt, remorse, feelings of emptiness and hollowness, and feelings at times of self-loathing. And it's fascinating to me that Jesus is about 33 years old here and never in his entire life has he experienced the human emotion of guilt, of, of regret, of thinking, oh no, why did, I, why did I do that? That was such a poor decision. He doesn't know what that feels like. He lived his life in perfection so that he would be without blemish in order to fulfill that, that covenant that he had made with the Father and with, with us that he would overcome death and hell for and in behalf of each of us. So here he is coming into the garden and all of a sudden he's feeling not just a little bit of remorse, not just a little bit of regret or a little bit of guilt, but he's feeling that for and in behalf of all of us. It's coming in infinite proportions. Is it any wonder he turns to his three apostles and says, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Now, it's not just the natural consequences of our wrongdoing and our sins that Jesus is experiencing here. We're told in the Book of Mormon that Jesus experiences other things as well. Some of the, the information that these Book of Mormon prophets fill in for us, some of the, the blanks that get filled in are statements such as, he suffereth the pains of every living creature, all men, women, and children through all time. So listen to these words of the angel delivered to King Benjamin and from King Benjamin to the people and by default through the quarter of time to us. Mosiah chapter 3 verse 7, and lo, he shall suffer temptations and pain of body, hunger, thirst, and fatigue, even more than man can suffer, except it be unto death, for behold, blood cometh from every poor so great shall be his anguish for the wickedness and the abominations of his people." So when the Old Testament writers say things like, he will be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, you then read these passages from the Book of Mormon and we see that there is no mortal pain, no mortal anguish, whether it be physical in nature or mental or emotional or psychological or relational or any pain associated with abuse being inflicted upon an individual, there is nothing that you and I can experience in this life that Jesus doesn't understand experientially, that he doesn't understand perfectly. Now, as he's going through this ordeal in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
once again, I know that my Redeemer lived. He didn't give up. He didn't stop that process early, even though he had power to do so. He wasn't being forced. This was a free will offering. He was using his agency to choose to do this for us. Once his experience there is complete, then the arresting party arrives there in the middle of the night. So you can picture this. This is happening around Passover, so it's a full moon. We're in the, the middle of the night, so you can picture this uh, full moon somewhere overhead shining down its light into this garden when this group of men come with swords and spears and staffs and, and torches and lanterns, and there stands Jesus in majesty and in glory that this world has never known before, having just completed what he has done in Gethsemane. It's fascinating to me when you read John 18, John's account tells us that the group stands there semi-paralyzed. They don't, they don't know what to do. And so Jesus has to step forward and ask them, whom seek ye? And their response is, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. And his answer was, I am, or in the Greek, ego, a me, implication being that he just introduced himself as the great I am from the Old Testament, Jehovah, the, the, the God of the Old Testament. And you'll notice in John's account that the whole arresting party falls backward to the ground. Nobody moves. He has to ask again, whom seek ye? And they say, we seek Jesus of Nazareth, and he tells them, I have told you, I am. And at that point, Peter comes forward and cuts off Malchus's ear. <sighs> Jesus would have been completely justified in striking down that group, but he didn't. He would have been justified in turning to Malchus. We get his name out of John's Gospel who just got his ear cut off, and he would have been justified in turning and saying to Malchus, do you really think that hurts? Because Jesus knows something of infinite agony, not the kind of pain that Malchus is going through. But Jesus didn't chide Malchus. Jesus didn't mock him, nor did Jesus ignore him. While none of Malchus's comrades, none of his friends came to his defense that night, there was one person who defended Malchus, and it happens to be the very person that Malchus came to arrest or to help in capturing. As Jesus turns to Peter and stops him and says, put up your sword, and then he turns to Malchus, and in Luke's gospel we're told, that Jesus heals that ear. The fact that we know Malchus's name gives me hope that Jesus healed more than just Malchus's ear that night, that something deep in Malchus's heart was also touched and healed. When Jesus would have been so justified in condemning him and the rest of the group, he chose to stand up under that situation and suffer it. He didn't resist it. He was willing to go through with it. I know that my Redeemer lived for me and for you, and this is another story showing that. Now, he's brought to the trials, and I love Nephi's words in 1 Nephi 19 when he sums up those, those trial experiences in front of the Sanhedrin as well as in, in front of those three Roman trials, Pilate, Herod, and Pilate, and the mockery that he takes from the, the soldiers, the Roman soldiers. Listen to verse 9 in 1 Nephi 19. And the world, because of their iniquity, shall judge him to be a thing of naught. Wherefore, they scourge him, and he suffereth it. 
they smite him, and he suffereth it. Yea, they spit upon him, and he suffereth it. And you might ask, why? Nephi gives you the answer. Because of his loving kindness and his long suffering toward the children of men, I know that my Redeemer lived for me when everything in his physical nature would have been pleading with him to give up or to stop the abuse that was being inflicted upon him by these wicked people who are, are abusing him senselessly. To use Isaiah's phrase, he gave his back to the smiters and his cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. And at any time, Jesus has the power to stop it, but he didn't. He suffered it, which means he allowed it. He lived for us so that he could fulfill an infinite atonement. Now, Jesus is placed on the cross. It's ironic to me that the first thing we have recorded coming from him after being placed so cruelly on that cross and having been treated so terribly by those soldiers, the first thing we hear from, from Calvary's cross is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus lived for us. He's showing us an example of how to live. He, he's giving us the way to, to handle difficult situations in our own life that come forward. Now, we're told that from about noon to 3 p.m. on the cross, thick clouds gather, darkness gathers, and the full weight of Gethsemane is going to return to him, but now on the cross, lifted up, stretched out, and hanging there on that cross. In that situation, President Russell M. Nelson said, uh, tying in Gethsemane with Golgotha, he says, under the direction of his father, he was the creator of this and other worlds. He chose to submit to the will of his father and do something for all of God's children that no one else could do. Condescending to come to earth as the only begotten of the Father in the flesh, he was brutally reviled, mocked, spit upon, and scourged. In the Garden of Gethsemane, our Savior took upon himself every pain, every sin, and all of the anguish and sufferings ever experienced by you and me and by everyone who has ever lived or will ever live. Under the weight of that excruciating burden, he bled from every pore. All of this suffering was intensified as he was cruelly crucified on Calvary's cross. So you get this intensification of everything that's that the, the same things he's experienced in the garden, but now he's vertical, he's stretched out, he's in front of a whole group of people. You can see why this pain and anguish would be intensified. Once again, every part of his mortal body would have been pleading with his spirit to give up the ghost, to not have to keep enduring this unfair and infinite agony that it was being put through. But I love the fact that Jesus lived for us until the point when he could finally say at the very end three of my favorite words in all of Scripture, it is finished. Only then could he freely and willingly give up the ghost. Only then did he choose to give up the ghost because it was finished. The price was paid. Our souls had been redeemed from death and hell. The, the price had been paid for our souls so that we wouldn't have to suffer in an in, in infinite uh, punishment state forever. Now he freely gives up his ghost 
and he allows himself to die. With his body now being placed in the tomb for those three days of quiet rest. It's interesting, isn't it, that he gives up the ghost shortly before sundown on that Friday night, and when the sun sets, it will now be officially the Sabbath day for the Jews, a day of rest, and that particular Sabbath day, according to the Gospel of John, was also a high Sabbath because it was also the Passover celebration during that time. Isn't it interesting that the firstborn of the Father didn't get passed over like the firstborn in Egypt got passed over because the blood of the Lamb was placed on the lintels of the door and the doorposts, and on this event, the firstborn son did not get passed over, but he stood betwixt you and justice, and he absorbed the full weight of justice until he could say, it is finished, and only then did he give up the ghost. Now, we celebrate Easter morning, that triumphant day when Jesus, raised from the dead, walks out of that tomb, glorified and resurrected. That event is amazing. Now we can stand and say, I know that my Redeemer lives. Brothers and sisters, as we contemplate this story, it's important for me to look back at how Jesus lived that opened the door for him to be able to live in his resurrection, and then for me to try to emulate that example and walk that path today so that Jesus can live again symbolically in me, guiding me, shaping me, honing me, helping me become more like him so that it can be real, those teachings and those miracles and that hope that gets spread to other people. Listen to these words. He lives to silence all my fears. He lives to wipe away my tears. He lives to calm my troubled heart. He lives all blessings to impart. Jesus didn't walk out of that tomb that Easter morn just so that we could celebrate the event of the resurrection and leave it there. He walked out of that tomb so that we could continually live ourselves, so that we could have life in us, that life that grows from line upon line, precept upon precept until that glorious day of our own resurrection and of our own potential exaltation down the road. He lives. All glory to his name. He lives. My Savior still the same. Oh, sweet the joy this sentence gives. I know that my Redeemer lives, and I know that my Redeemer lived, and I know that my Redeemer will yet live inside of each of us as we seek during this Easter time of year and for the rest of the year and for the rest of our lives to allow him to touch our lives, to heal us, to bring life to those parts of our soul that feel dead, to bring new life to those parts of our soul that feel blind or halt or maimed or leprous in any way. And as we allow him to more fully become a part of our life, his glorious resurrection will continue to bear fruit as we become more like him. He lives. My kind, wise, heavenly friend, he lives and loves me and you to the end. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.